So hello and welcome to today's complimentary webinar in the Sartorius Stadium Data Analytics Solutions series of complimentary webinars. My name is Elena Eriksson and I will be the organizer and moderator for this presentation. Today we have the great honor and pleasure to have a guest presentation out of AstraZeneca and the presenters are Lars Carlson and Mats Josefsson. Lars is a senior scientist in the inhalation unit within the pharmaceutical technology and development uh, in the AstraZeneca facility in Malmdal in Gothenburg. And uh, he focuses on the development and analysis of inhalation devices. Uh, Lars is also associate professor in analytical chemistry at the University of Lund in southern Sweden. Mats Josefsson is a principal scientist within the same unit uh, or the same department in, in Mölndal Gothenburg and he focuses on design of experiments, multivariate data analysis and also PAT, QED, spectroscopy and, and hyperspectral imaging and, and what Mats doesn't know about these topics is probably not worth knowing at all. So with that little introduction, uh, Mats and Lars, please take over, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Leonard, for your introduction, and thanks also for giving us the possibility to talk about something that we think is really, really fun to do, both at the lab, at the lab bench, but also behind the computer, and that is the use of acoustics, sound, acoustic emission in connection with characterization and analysis of an inhaled devices. Uh, before we go on, let, uh, let us acknowledge colleagues Mikael, Kure, Alex and Roland who has contributed also to this particular presentation in, uh, in various ways. So in terms, uh, in terms of the content, we, we will look at some model systems. We will look at two different uh, devices for this application. We will also focus a bit on automated analysis of inhalers because that environment we is very suitable for this particular application since we get a lot of data from that. We will of course um, explain our approach of our, uh, how we use acoustic emission, uh, how we process the sound, how we calculate and in every step of the way here we will try as often as possible to relate to studies, experiment and applications where we have used um, this particular application that we, we're talking about today. We will of course also go in uh, some degree in-depth explanation of our chemometrics and the, how we use that in terms of uh, connecting to the sound events that we look at and we will also talk about what we call a sound process, how the sound develops over time. And we could go on talking about this for a long time but when you see a slide entitled Conclusion, we're actually approaching the end. So in terms of the model systems, we will look at two different inhalers today. And one is a the Jenner inhaler, which is uh, developed by our partner Sofotec in Germany. And that is a mar marketed inhaler, and it's a, it's a multi-dose breath actuated dry powder inhaler. It's quite popular with patients, it's, it's easy to use, it's quite reliable and it has a multiple feedback and safety mechanism. Uh, important for this application though is that it has a reservoir. You, you, the, load, the dose is loaded from a, a reservoir or a container. The other inhaler which we will address today is a prototype inhaler. It's in development and that also it's a multi-dose DPI but it has a different configuration in terms of loading the doses. The, in this case, the, load, the, the doses are pre-metered, so they're already loaded in terms of when we do the assembly of that particular inhaler. So, uh, um, we, we do this in an environment. Well, I, I would say 90% of the applications we will show today are done in an environment where we use automated analysis of inhaled devices. We use robotics. And in general terms, why do we want to use automation? It's because we see business benefits related to that. We have an increase in efficiency and capability, and we also can mitigate some she concerns related to repeated movements and that type of thing. 
And in general terms also, I mean, we have a philosophy in the whole department here to develop automation in parallel to when we develop devices. Because we get, we get a lot of data out of that and we also, we also see that as an important part of our development programs, whether it be to develop a new device design or look at new formulations. So in this particular environment, that's, that's where we use the acoustic emission. And if you look on the, uh, the picture to the, to the left, you see how a typical setup can see. We simply put the microphone close to the device where something happened. In this particular case, it's ready to emit the dose. And, uh, so, uh, and then the, it will collect the sound. And so when we have this, um, in early development, we have prototype robots, prototype uh, automated platforms we use. And uh, so that's quite handy to, to use the uh, acoustics as a means of, of uh, in, um, as a tool for development. But our goal is to develop GMP robotics. And this is a picture of a GMP model. And that's, that's, of course, then something that we can transfer to uh, manufacturing operations. So, but why really do we want to use acoustic emission in this particular area? Since we come from the analytical side and the characterization side, this was really something we wanted to do in terms of looking at metadata. Typically, in the analysis of automated auto, automated analysis of devices, we usually use currently use pressure drop as the only means of metadata. And we noticed early that we get a lot of more information from the sound profiles than using only the pressure drop. Also, in an environment where I just talked about, where we have prototype robots and new designs, it the sound data enables us to sort of differentiate between a problem that can be come from the uh, device or it can come from the analysis equipment. Longer term then, and that is related to the device functionality and performance, we have a vision, let's say, that we can uh, use sound as an aid for designing in robustness and functional performance of a new device design. We can also use this to capture early problems in a, uh, in a device development program. Sound is very efficient to, to look at differences and so trending is a strong performance in terms of uh, sound analysis. We also use sound in a different way which we're not going to address in this particular presentation, but that is in a univariate mode. We just measure timings of mechanical events. And it's, it's quite important then to map uh, a, a process so you see which sound comes from the robot or from the analysis and which sound comes from, uh, from the device. And then you can use these timings uh, because they are often indicative of the quality and the performance of the inhaler. Acoustic emission, we're certainly not the first ones to use acoustic emission. Uh, it has been used in several uh, other industries and other areas of research. Typically process monitoring is, is one of those for blending, not only in pharmaceutics but in other industries as well. Reactions, you can, do, you can look at progression of, of reactions with sound. Mechanical robustness, ball bearings, you can measure that with sound. Uh, in the airplane industry, for instance, you can you can use that to, to measure sort of the long-term performance of, of uh, mechanical parts, obviously very important. Inhalation is also an area where it has been used before, but in a slightly different way when, uh, than we are presenting today, namely in adherence monitoring and in a clinical trial setting where there are companies who have a whole infrastructure and logistics for uh, they have devices, let's say, where they have small microphones where they can sort of track how the, the patient or the trial person uses the device uh, when they take the dose and, and such things. So 
So that is something where they use a very uh, uh, advanced design in terms of the device. They have microphones included, whereas in our way we have microphones outside and not built into the inhaler. So we listen passively outside. Yes, and um, uh, now we can think about why uh, I was actually working with sound and uh, uh, batch processes within, within pharmaceutical um, uh, process monitoring some, uh, well, many years ago. And one bad thing that happened was that uh, as soon as you had done the sound development in the, in the, in the processing um, in a small scale and you scale up to pilot scale, then the sound pattern is different, the sound signature is different in the scale up and then in the full scale it's also yet another scale. But in this case for inhalers it's actually a fantastic win-win situation because here we are forced to have the essentially the same construction from phase three uh, clinical trials and for onwards for the for the device. So the sound work that we invest in uh, early will stay invested, so to say, uh, also in full scale, which is uh, one reason why this is more worthwhile for inhalers than for other batch uh, pharmaceutical processes. And uh, how we do this, this is um, more details about how we do it. We record sound um, in um, a, a format that is FLAC and that is a non-destructible sound format. We are not using MP3 that is a destructible format. You could use a less compressed format like DAV files and so on but we choose this one just because it's somewhat compressed, saves some space. Um, we calculate sound spectra at time intervals using the Fourier transform and we use a script uh, and, and we can use a script directly inside uh, SEMPIA uh, to import the spectra from binary files uh, and we can then treat the sound spectra in the same way as we do spectra from NIR, Raman, UEVIS or mass spectrometry. So essentially the operation within SIMCA is the same. If you are used to, to any multivariate software you can run this within uh, the multivariate software in, in the same way when you have done these uh, steps, the previous steps. And um, we go on here. Um, and here is a typical um, sound uh, track from a prototype inhaler. You see first uh, you have a you have a beginning uh, where there is a sharp when the air suction is started in the system then you have a big transient when the when the powder is released and then you have a sort of decaying uh, shape and then the suction is stopped and then you have some other robotic sounds down here down the line. So these, uh, these sounds are collected, uh, first we collected them by hand uh, with a timer, but now we are collecting them in a, um, uh, with a sensor that attaches or feels the magnetic um, uh, change when, when there is an actuator that uh, passes by or that the, the, um, the robot passes by an actuator and then you can get the repeatable time track for every inhaler and that is much more convenient than to do this by hand and makes sense in many ways. If we look at the script, um, and this is just a small part of the script that is the core making the Fourier transform calculation. This is not rocket science, it's just r running regular Python and uh, code with the NumPy uh, library and you can do this. Uh, we have done it both outside um, Simca as a script producing files and inside Simca directly uh, funneling the files 
or not the files, but the data into Simca as such. Both things are possible, um, and uh, it turns out to be very convenient to to package it in one flow uh, with a script like this. Um, here are the spectra. You can see example spectra from the first. The first transient is very sharp. So we have a lot happening in the beginning. So we are trying to do very um, fine resolution measurements here. Zero to it's 14 mi milliseconds between the uh, consecutive windows. Of course, the window spans a lot more, like 0.3 seconds. But the, it's the difference that counts in multivariate analysis. So uh, we also can see here that we have some very sharp resonances in this device. Um, the, that's the sharp spikes, and you see at uh, as a progression progression with time, you see that in the 120 to 140 millisecond range, the spectra, the these sharp resonances have been decreased, while the general uh, noise pattern also has changed a bit. So this is. Um, reflecting the powder going through the system. Here we also, uh, before we do uh, raw data, uh, before we do multivariate data analysis, it's always good to look at the raw data. And one way to look at the raw data is to do a waterfall plot. And this is a waterfall plot of January uh, spectra. Uh, you see a first front here um, that is um, uh, parts of this startup sequence. Then we have actually starting of the flow at uh, well 21.2 seconds, and we have the release of the powder starting at 21.25 seconds. Um, and here you can get the general feeling for what's happening and you can and this is here we have collected many more spectra to just produce this slide um, and that would not be viable to do in a multivariate data analysis we don't need that many we need about 20 spectra or 40 spectra or something like that that's sufficient but to produce this view we can do many more spectra and you also, if you have a good screen and the connection is good, you can see a slight sideways track here. And that is actually a part of the inhaler that is uh, having a pitch change. And uh, Lars will talk about what that part is later. So um, always look at the raw data. It's a good advice as well. Um, here are the parts. In more detail, uh, we are using uh, the FLAC XC module that can be that is open sourced on the on the internet, and we then use audio read uh, the audio read package in Python to get data from the FLAC XC. We use NumPy, an numerical library, to do all the um, uh, linear algebra that uh, is needed for this and the Fourier transforms. This is a uh, uh, package NumPy is on the same level of competence as MATLAB, I would say. It's uh, very well used in many research activities and very well tested by many scientists. And then we use uh, the multivariate package Simca 14 in this case, um, and we run PCA, PLS, and OPLS on this spectra um, and that's the software part of the experimental i would say and here we have a prototype run um, we have three different formulations um, and we have five runs that means that we are emptying five cavities for each formulation and we are running four or we are running 20 spectra per actuation and we are doing centered unscaled principal components analysis here you see that we have um, in those different formulations we have five percent of the active and uh, eight percent of the active or one percent of the active and 
the rest is the, as a filler up to the same uh, weight is by lactose. Um, so this is a this is an ordered mix as it's called. Uh, and you can see from this side that you can see diff you can see that these tracks are going in different directions for the different formulations. If we take the next, uh, we fold up the third component on the x-axis, you see that they are actually clearly separated in, the, um, in this profile. And it's, it should be viable to apply a, a regression model to see um, the amount of, of, or at least the qualitative difference between these three formulations in the same inhaler. So that we um, do. Uh, at this time, I only put in the 8% active and the 1% active in the model to um, make it more interesting. And then we can use the 5% formulation as a and predict the results and see what happens if this works at all. This is uh, exploring the abilities of, of acoustic emission. Um, so this is, uh, and here we see the loading vector for this for this OPLS model, and you see clearly you have we still have this very strong um, resonance here that is different with different formulations, and we also have a fair amount of uh, well systematic uh, vacuum cleaner sound, if we say so. Uh, that is is uh, varying with those two, uh, which is different between those two APIs. Um, and if we now do the prediction, we can see here that we, uh, if we look, we have this is prediction for all, and the colors are here. Eight percent is uh, yellowish orange, and. Um, 1% is, is greenish blue and 5% uh, should be somewhere here around a greenish yellow and we see that all the 5% uh, APIs are actually falling between the 1 and 8 which so it is correctly ordered. We should now notice that this is the full uh, track of all spectra and <clears throat> at some points this this is a good predictor and sometimes it's, it's in the end I would say it's we should expect it to not be so much material so the ability to predict well is less in the end of this sound profile. Um, we can look at the more detailed image here. Here, is, here are all predictions again plotted in a different way with a predicted API as the y-axis and then the time track on the x-axis and you see here that the the red ones that are inside the model they are better predicted of course we see that the blue ones that are truly predicted they are spreading more in the end than in the beginning which means that we have this case that uh, we have a worse prediction in the end, but we in the middle here we have actually quite good collection of, of, of this one, uh, except for the first run. I know this is the first run, the lowest one. That one's run is slightly different, and we know it's different. That's due to the acoustic properties when we have when we are going from zero open cavities to one open cavity. Then that's a much that's a different acoustic event than to going from having one open on one side and having one closed on the other side, so to say. So this is um, so we where this is this deviation is is uh, still fantastic, but it's there is an explanation for that one. So we can more look at these four other ones if we look at the regular situation of repetition. So, um, in this way, I think it's actually viable to uh, think about uh, it's probably, we cannot say that it's possible to do a 
correct content uh, calibration, but we can at least see qualitative variations and we can see um, uh, similarities and dissimilarities uh, with in, within formulation changes and such things. Um, Yes, and now moving from the prototype DPI, we move back to the, to the January again. And this is, of course, a very smart device. It has, of course, been made for patients. But considering the nice sound it emits, it's almost like it was made for sound nerds like Mats and myself. Anyway, what we look at, or what we listen to, rather, is two, two different sound events. One we call the load, and that occurs when you press the green button in the, in the picture there and that is when the dose is loaded from a reservoir inside the inhaler. What we call the trig sound is really two sounds in reality. And one is the trig which is the feedback to the patient which is mechanical sound but it's also when the dose is emitted through the classifier or cyclone it's also mentioned which is a, a device which is dispersion unit inside uh, the the um, device also close to the mouthpiece. Uh, let's look at the sound profiles then when we have uh, simply the raw data from these uh, from a general analysis. We have the load and the trig and the load of course occurs before the trig and in this particular case around three minutes you have the sound profile from from the load uh, and we have a so important uh, part of, of that trace and takes away the robot uh, events that are not so important. And the trig uh, then, depending of course the robot movements and operations, occurs later, typically around 21 seconds in this particular case. And that is when the dose is emitted and yeah, the device has been moved by the robot to to the place where it uh, emits the dose into the where the dose is captured. We stay. We're going to look at a very short video now, just to show you how the load operation looks from the outside. And this is what you will see here: is the robot arm coming in from the right with the device and it goes into the load position and there is a, a, a mechanical finger or a piston that simply uh, pushes the button down. So this, this sound doesn't really sound much in reality and you would think it doesn't contain much information. If I should say something similar, what, what is it similar to? It's like cracking a small Coca-Cola can or something like that. So you would imagine that how can this be important but we have looked at that sound as well and this is work by a student working with us now uh, Mr. Mikael Bubai and he has looked at the different steps in this small operation uh, going from start to finish when the piston reaches the load button and the load button is pressed down and the piston ascends again so this type of mapping for this process and we should also mention here that we have uh, a, a script here that can do very uh, high uh, resolution uh, plotting, PCA plots. This is a PCA plot. Um, and there you can see the PCA trace or the rather the, the sound process of, of this uh, operation. And this helps us to sort of separate out what comes from the robot, what comes from the interaction robot device and what comes from the from the device itself. But it actually is different. It, we looked at as a model sort of experiment, we look at two different lactose qualities. These are two respitoses and they are different, different in terms of their size, their particle size distribution. And they come out in this uh, PCA score plot as, as quite different just in this little load sound. Now we are going to look at uh, the trig sound, or the, rather the trig and flush, because this is the dispersion unit, and in this 
movie here, you can see particles coming through. And the dispersion unit is, of course, made for the de-agglomeration of, part, uh, of API from the lactose carrier particles. If it is lactose, that is the carrier. And also for sort of the retention of coarse particles. So this is what makes the nice sound that uh, sort of a turbine-like sound that Mats was referring to earlier. This film is rather long, so I think we just stop it and go on. And in this slide, we have characterized really and looked at uh, looked at the uh, PCA plot and looked at what's happening with the sound uh, with time. So, and we have two different uh, configurations, one in empty inhaler and one filled just with placebo powder. And if we look at what's happening uh, with time here, you see for the placebo trace, it, it's quite a dynamic sort of process and it moves over time over the PCA area. Whereas the empty one, it's, it's not silent, of course, it will be uh, noisy as well. But in terms of dynamics, it's more, it's more still and it's you know, static and it will only sort of change when it comes uh, to the end of the suction uh, time that is set by the robot. And here we have a loading plot of the previous score plot and you see here this is actually unit variance scaled and Lars is preferring to have those uh, uh, models unit variance scaled in many cases. Uh, so the, actually the information here is, we can see that the information is all over the place in many variables, but you can see some clear uh, peaks or, or indentations, I mean, less energetic regions around slightly be below 2000 Hertz and here between 4000 6000 Hertz um, and uh, it is um, probably very I mean in the in the in the prototype inhaler we have a defined cavity that has a res need has a resonance frequency but here we have more uh, as you saw a turbine and you have we have a flowing through system that is also varying in frequency which means that we will not we will have less discrete uh, stable frequencies here but still we have the ability to make good models from this pattern um, that is somewhat complicated so next slide and if we look at the and this is a PCA plot again and if we look at the two uh, different uh, 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 sound events that we are trying to characterize the load and the trig and this in this particular experiment we have two different lactoses again and you can see that the um, PCA trace or the um, let's say the sound process is sort of much more uh, dynamic and it gives a, a bigger sort of uh, effect in in this particular plot for the for the trig sound whereas the load sound in this respect is smaller. So if we go and zoom in on the load, we see also there, that actually it's the blue and the red trace for the different lactoses. And you can actually see that also here in the load signal, you see differences between these two lactoses in terms of their, uh, their sound process in the load units operation. So you've seen this slide before for, for load and a PCI score plot. We see differences uh, between two uh, different uh, carriers. We can hear difference in the sound and we can calculate that. If we look at the trig, I mean, when the inhaler really sings and this tur turbine-like sounds, it's also, you can also see a difference in, in the PCI score plot. And often, I, in, according to our experience, uh, this simple plot, I mean a PCA plot, score plot, is often um, sufficient to, to uh, assign a, a specific event to, uh, to a sound change. But we can also do other plots. For instance, if we look at the same data uh, and we do OPLS plot instead, 
and this was for the load and you can see that uh, it's quite uh, it's quite different it's quite a clear difference between these two respitoses in terms of sound and uh, the load operation if we look at the trig there's also a difference but uh, actually and perhaps a bit contrary to what we thought it's the difference is is, is there but not so large uh, relative to the to the load yeah, and this is only 0.7% uh, predictive variance, so to say, in, in the OPLS model. So this is really very small. And the other one was 3% about that. Yes, correct. Okay, so moving into some conclusions, I think uh, we have shown that uh, with this not only in this talk but with other experiments that acoustic emission combined with chemometrics is, is a capable tool to distinguish between various things that changes the sound like different formulations and raw material qualities and it's also quite efficient to see change to monitor trends and it's, it's especially efficient in an automated platform sort of environment and it's a it's a useful tool at least for prototype type robot and automated platforms where we can use, uh, distinguish between problems related to the device, the prototype device, or the analysis. And as we move on and we do these high resolution plots, we can really see that A, B combined with multivariate analysis, we can get detailed information regarding the device and its operational performance. Yes, and uh, this is somewhat unusual uh, for a normal MIR spectroscopist, but anywhere where we have good uh, quality measurements, we can we can add new dimensions to the interpretation of results. And the stranger the measurements, the more useful the chemometrics, I would say, because we can apply, the less we understand in the beginning, the more we have used for the chemometrics tool to, to elucidate what uh, we can use this for and how. And we can also use very small signals to our benefit in this case, we have noticed. So um, that is a very promising tool to, for inhalation devices, I would say. And what we haven't mentioned also, it's, this is quite, a, 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 it's, it's very inexpensive equipment, so this is something that you can easily set up and do experiments with. Uh, so uh, instead of saying don't try this at home, you can try it at home. Yeah. So it's very easy. And as I said in the beginning, we're quite, it's quite a fun technique to work with. And we're very happy to apply this to, to various projects that we have here. But we have also, there's also a scientific side to this, and we have presented it on some conferences. And we have also received some recognitions there, uh, both in a, a conference related to sort of devices, uh, but also in a, in a chemometric sort of uh, related conference. And on that note, I think we have reached the end of this talk. and. If Lennart is still awake, I think he should now move into the Q&A session. Thank you. Lars and, thank Mats, you. Lars and Mats, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for this very interesting presentation. There are a couple of questions already typed in in the questions field. Uh, I will just turn off the recording and shortly be back with the, with the Q&A. So for the moment, thank you very much both to you, Lars and Mats, and all the watchers.